Yeah, welcome to another edition of the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast. The Legendino is still in Rio, but not for much longer. In, in Well, I'm sure you'll be there for many years to come, but you're coming over this side of the water, I understand. Yeah, in fact, by the time this one comes out, I'll probably have already got already gone gone to England and and, and come back. Um, but my mum's coming up eighty seven, so oh. uh, I'm 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 looking forward to to going back and and taking her to the theatre. What a what what a dutiful son I've become in my dotage, <laughs> mate. You've done really really well, and she's done really well. So wish her all the best from us. Uh, first of all, I look forward to at least seeing you for a moment or two whilst you're over. Hey, an old mate of yours is back joining us tonight or today or whenever it is you're listening to this podcast. And an old mate of the of, of the program, because this is the second time that we've had the the, the pleasure and the honour to talk with Daryl Tellis, who Hello. has Welcome. a fantastic story to tell. He's told it in a book. And this is a book. I think it's 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 an important book, and it's it's a book that uh, I love to recommend. Daryl, tell us about your book. Oh, thank you, uh, Tim and Dotton. It's lovely to be with you again. I didn't think I would come back a second time because you always say that to the guests. <laughs> oh, and I no. wonder whether they do come back. Do they come back? Well, we had to bring you back because oh. the book. The book where queer, where queer and we should be here, the perils mm. and pleasures of being a gay football fan was, I think, the first exposition of, of the subject. But since you've been on, old Ryland, aka Ryland Clark, has gone and done an entire TV series on football homophobia. Yes, yes. Mm. Have, have you have you not seen it? I haven't actually. No, I haven't. I'm not an avid TV viewer, to be honest. Would you? Um, be but um, I will have to catch up with it. Yes, I know. Um, we seem to be the subject of the day, don't we? And it, of course, it's football versus homophobia month, um, February. That's if this comes out in February. But it, well, it doesn't matter, does it? Football versus homophobia month, the fifteenth month. Um, since the event first started, and uh, it's also LGBT History Month in the UK. So, um, all things considered, I think uh, I'm honoured to be back on your show. The, the, the well, reason... You're not, you're not Doctor Who aside. You're not <laughs> yes. a TV man, but you are an author. And it, this is just something I was thinking about this morning. The pair of you, in different ways. Yes. You're both sons of Africa. And you've both written books which can take you to very dark places. Both of your books are, are quite frighteningly honest. They're funny as well, but they're honest and they're dark. Uh, and uh, your story, Daryl, of being a gay football fan during from, from the 70s onwards... There's 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 plenty of light in the story, but there's 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 some shade as well, isn't there, along the way? There is. Um there is. Um and that's why I called it perils and pleasures, because um you couldn't be gay and um well you couldn't be gay and out really <laughs> sometimes in the eighties, you know, section twenty eight and all that. So it was difficult. Yeah, you see the reason why I wanted to mention um, that when you were last on, actually, um, the your book was the first exposition that certainly I'd come across of being a football fan uh, and gay and how now it's uh, much more accepted through the prism of, you know, a big TV star. I've got no problem with that, but I always feel like, it's not known that the present day uh, generation yeah. stand on the shoulders of giants. Ryland Clark was born in 1988, which, you know, I'm not, I'm not knocking him at all. Um, mm. I must say it's still brave, even in today's age, to come out at all, let alone say, look, I am a football fan and you'll see me at football grounds and I'm out and proud. But you think 1988, you know, Daryl Tellis was on his own in those days. <laughs> you know, now you go to a football ground, and I was 
at football ground last Saturday. And mm. you don't hear homophobia. I'm, I'm not saying it doesn't exist still, but you don't hear it as much as you would naturally hear it once upon a time. You know, often to abuse your opponent's best player or whatever it is, but you, don't, you just don't hear it anymore. And maybe I'm going to the right grounds and things like that, but I suspect that your experience of being not just, as Tim puts it, a son of Africa, which, by the way, the new Doctor Who is as well, mm. and um, gay <laughs> and a spud at the same time. <laughs> I mean, that is uh, three blows in one. Uh, or it would have been once upon a time, I would have thought. Yeah, am I dreaming? Gosh. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. What gets me sometimes um, is that the Premier League and others think um, that uh, L the, uh, the LGBT community only got together when they recognised um, uh, football fan groups, which was about 14 years ago. In fact, February is the 14th anniversary, uh, sorry, not the 14th, the 10th anniversary, sorry, of the, the proud newly whites of Spurs. Um, but, you know, LGBT people didn't just originate in this century. Um, and it, it's, it's very much um, an education thing that we have to continually say that there were people that were out and proud after the 67 Reform Act and the 70s and 80s were particularly um, difficult and those people should be acknowledged. So I'm glad that podcasts like yourself are giving a light on those. And I only have to say that uh, after the last podcast, I, I got many um, uh, people contacting me and um, it was it was good. It was really good to see the amount of people that really didn't know about the history and thought that it all started coming alive um, in uh, in this century. And also it fascinates me that uh, um, in the black community as well, Justin Fashney, the story of Justin Fashney uh, needs to be continually t told because as you rightly say, Dr. Um, there's intersectionalities between race, class and sexuality. And I suppose the new doctor personifies some of that. As you said, Daryl, there have been organ organisation long, long before 10 years ago. And the game that we've chosen to have a look at today, yes. it's important for a number of reasons. We're going. Well, let me take you down because we're going back to August the 25th, 1990. First game of the new season, still not the Premier League, no. but in some ways it is the start of the Premier League. Why? Mm. Because England in, in Italia 90 was huge for getting a new audience for football, for reminding some who drifted away from the game why, why it was special. And obviously the heroes were the Tottenham pair, Paul Gascoigne and Gary Lineker. And here they were in action, first game of the season. So it, it, it's an important game just in purely footballing terms. Mm -hmm. I was there. I have very strong memories of this game. And you have particular memories and a particular reason for this game standing out, don't you? Yes, uh, here's the programme. Um, yep. <laughs> authentic. Which is, <laughs> yeah, which is very authentic because um, there's a story behind why it's all like this, but I'll go into that maybe when we have time. Does it have anything yeah. to do with Hampstead Heath? Oh, my God. Did I put that in the book? Oh you put dear. that in the book, yes. Okay. You were, you were well, very frank. <laughs> Maybe I was a bit too um, honest in my book. Uh, Oversharing, Daryl. Oversharing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one pound thirty for the program, and you're absolutely right. I mean, I think the pivotal moment came in that summer, Italia '90. I remember watching with you, Tim, um, and others um, on the big screen, uh, Heysel, uh, the disaster at Heysel. And then you had um, the side events at Hillsborough. And the tail end of the 80s was, um, well, really, really poor in terms of uh, the reputation of football fans. And then suddenly we had Italia 90 and we were stuck. Where were we? On an island, I think. England was sent to an island because they couldn't be um, 
couldn't play games on the mainland. Mm. And uh, I think everyone, including FIFA, wanted us out early doors, and we didn't. And 1991, there's three reasons, really. The first reason is, I think you're right, I think Paul Gascoigne was at his peak in that season. He was probably the best player in Europe. I don't know, I'll, I'll, I'll bow to your wiser wisdom about South America and elsewhere, but I, I certainly think we had the best player um, in Europe at his peak. Well, well, going into the World Cup, he was like our little secret, wasn't he? Yes. I, I don't think people really knew how, how good he was. And I, I remember a game just before the World Cup at home against Man United, and he just touched the heights that day, and every time he got the ball, the stadium went quiet. What's he mm. going to do now? What's he going to do now? But it was our secret. And I remember before England's first game in the World Cup, there was this big discussion. Should we pick Gascoigne or should we pick should we pick Steve McMahon? Which seems like yes. a ludicrous discussion yeah. now, but it was big at the time. And then he, he he just grabs the World Cup by the scruff of his neck uh, mm. and, 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 and he was magic. And here he is. Um, playing in an English English league ground for the for the first game since, and it's your first game with an organisation of gay supporters. Yes, because you know, as I said, when I I came out at university in the last year, when I came out, I said I'm not going to football. You know, I love football, but I'm not going to go and just hear people around me casually being homophobic at the time. And also, I didn't have many mates to go out with. I wanted to be out at a football, uh, at a football ground. So for about three or four years, yeah. I missed the 87 final. I had to watch that on the telly. Um, you know, and um, so I missed those years just after, yeah, 86 to about uh, 89. And then you're absolutely right. Someone puts an advert in Gay Times and the Gay Football Supporters Network is suddenly launched and uh, within a year, 300 uh, members um, join it. And um, amongst those, um, quite a high percentage were either Tottenham or Arsenal. Might have something to do where we met, which was in a North London pub. But, Can I just uh, state here that in the course of your book, um, the, the the team from the other end of the, of the Seven Sisters Road are almost always referred yes. to as Woolwich. Yes, if I ever said that word Arsenal, then I was uh, uh, yes, it, it was proof read out. I think, but, um, but um, yeah, so uh, this you know eighty nine Christmas eighty nine, I walk into a pub and it's full of gay men who are really into football. You know, really into football, not just into shorts or men in shorts. I can say that because I'm gay. Um, and um, the first game of the season, and also Tottenham. And so that was, it was amazing. There was, we went as a group. Uh, we met Manchester City fans before the game. Do you remember that Sam Fox used to have a pub? He used to have a little pub in Tottenham, Tim? Yes. Samantha Fox, yes. you know, we met there. <laughs> Sam Fox's pub. So there was about 12 of us, I think, six, eight Tottenham, four or five Manchester City fans. And uh, for all of us, I think, it was probably a real breath of fresh air and a real relief that we could, uh, you know, we could just be ourselves. And um, it was the start of um, something that lasted, you know, 30 years of my life. Um, and... Um, and it was a it was a very good season for Spurs, and uh, things have changed a lot, haven't they, since in those thirty years? But it was a tip top season for Spurs. And the other reason, of course, was Italian ninety, and um, it it drove a lot of people back to football. Um, and you're absolutely right. I I had to look again and think this was actually the start of the Premiership. Not 92. Mm. This was when football became fashionable again and people began to realise there was a lot of money <laughs> to be made out of this product. I think, that's, I think that is a really important consideration because gay football fans had always been in football and I don't think it would have come as a huge surprise uh, to 
a lot of football fans that there was an organisation of uh, gay football fans. And I don't think it would have come as a huge surprise to the FA or, you know, to the Premier League subsequently that, OK, we've got this demographic. At some point, football realised that the money, the money, the income that could come from football was more important than the divisions that separated football. And that's part, I think, of what brought English football back into the European fold. You know, this is where, or Britain, happened to be where the strongest support for football was. Not saying that there wasn't football support elsewhere, but, you know, if you think about travelling fans of... It, it all... goes so deep, isn't it, that the pyramid it's... goes deeper than it does anywhere You're else absolutely right You're so absolutely man right. city in the third division yeah still get you know they were still getting huge huge crowds that Did pyramid goes really deep there was somebody just the other day that came on the world football phone in and said uh was it leeds who were they talking about whichever team that they were talking about no it was derby wasn't it that's right it was it was derby. Derby we were having a conversation about they're derby getting twenty-five thousand, and they're in the in a the, week. what is effectively the third tier and they're it is, not even it is extraordinary. They're yeah. not even in the iconic football ground that they were in before, yeah. where you know you could think, well, you know, people have this sort of relationship with this football ground. They're essentially in, you know, a, a, a modern block, and they still have the same passion for the football uh, but here I, I as think, elsewhere. I think that this is an important point. I think one of the reasons that the new has worked so well in English football is that the roots of the old are so deep. I think had it just been the new, it would come across as forced and artificial. I think that, that that marriage between the new and the old has been fundamental. But like in football, so many things come bottom up. And that new, part of that new is the acceptance of Daryl and your community inside the stadiums. You put that on the agenda. They didn't put that. You put that on the agenda. So this meeting of you, 12 of you in this game in 1990, these are the giants upon whose shoulders the fans of today are standing. So I, I, so I think this is really, really important work that you oh, lot did all those years ago. That's lovely of you to say that. And uh, but I think, yeah, I felt it was also a cultural shift. Uh, Italian ninety, I talked about um, well, the fact that Gaza's tears um, were in, brought this sort of emotional aspect to football. It's a Shakespearean moment. Yes, uh, that's a Shakespearean it. moment. I'm mm -hmm. telling you. Yes, and suddenly, you know. Um, People were talking about uh, watching the game together. It became an event, didn't it? Um, a national sort of event. And um, so, yes, there was a real cultural sh shift. We'll have a look later whether there was a cultural shift on the top 10. But, <laughs> um, well, there's, yes. There's, <laughs> certainly was, um, but that, that word event, I think, is really important because there was a real sense of event around this game and that this was this because it was the first game of these players after, after Italian 90 and uh, Tottenham took the lead after two minutes and I know. Two watching minutes. these highlights watching the highlights to, to, to talk about this game today it's the first time I saw, I saw that goal and I shall tell you why because uh, at the time I was living the long hot summer of 1990 I was living on the Camden Road and I was still drinking I was still on the sauce in those days and I had a wonderful night out and uh and probably overindulged. And on the, the number 29 bus, the legendary number 29 bus on the way back, of course. I get off and I think, where's my wallet? Now, I know a little bit later in life, uh, the loss of a wallet proved uh, important for you. Thankfully, the loss of a wallet wasn't quite so important for me. There was a little bit of cash in it and stuff, but there were the Tottenham tickets. There were the tickets for the game. Oh. Tickets for the, the tickets for the game. Where are the tickets for the game? So uh, I had to go and sort that out with the ticket office. Obviously, the ones that, that my wallet had been swiped and uh, and uh, whoever had, had done it had managed to sell these tickets for the touts and 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 someone had made a lot of money out of it. But they got mm -hmm. us into the stadium in 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 um in a different place. So I missed 
I missed the goal. I missed the first goal of the season. And I was just there in time to see the Man City equaliser. Equaliser. And of course, isn't it uh, isn't it weird? I, I think it's really weird seeing uh, a legend, a living uh, legend, uh, Gary Lineker, back in his football shirt um, all those years ago. You know, um, he's now in his 60s, but it is just shows you how much things have changed and there he is right in the right spot knocks it in you know how many times did he do that for England and Tottenham and uh, then we have a a, there's a Shakespearean tragedy on the other side as well because uh, this is Man City the manager is Howard Kendall now he probably would have been the England manager they've just given it to Graham Taylor it probably would have been him because he'd done fantastic stuff for Everton and then he got to Spain and he, he, he'd been reasonably successful with Real Sociedad and he came back to England. But he had a massive drinking problem, huge drinking problem. I spent a day a few years ago working with Niall Quinn and we talked about this game. And he mm. said, you know, how he, how can he'd been up all night? Mm. He was on the piss all mm. night and he was just pissed out of his head. And on the morning of the game, he's yelling. I think it was Steve Redmond who was the captain, the centre back. And he's yelling at him, you're not good enough to be captain. You're not good enough to be captain of this football team. And he, he, he drops him and he changes the captain on the morning of the game. Uh, so uh, that, that's something. Which, so Paul which, Lake, which, wasn't it, that became? Yeah, yeah Paul Lake captain. became the captain. And his yeah. first touch as captain was to inadvertently head the ball backwards towards his own goal and set up Gary Lineker to, to make it 1-0. Well, yes. And you mentioned Niall Quinn. Um, that again brought back memories of the 80s, uh, uh, sorry, the 90s. Whenever Niall Quinn played against us, he scored a goal. I'm sure that's true. It caused us an immense amount of problems. And the goal that was uh, ruled out was perfectly good, I thought. Yeah, yeah, um, much wrong with it. <laughs> yeah. I just thought Quinn was so, we, we couldn't handle him. We were one of the clubs that couldn't ha- handle him. And I always used to say, well, Buy him, <laughs> put him in an R side. Uh, yeah, he's from Woolwich. He's got well, his background yeah, so in the Woolwich. Yeah, I know, but, uh, <laughs> you know, it brings back uh, those memories of, um, no, how could I don't know what we're going to do in the box? Who's going to mark him? <laughs> you know. Yeah, I know the way that City was set up, it was wingers to get the ball in for, for Niall Quinn. And it wasn't something that Tottenham defended against particularly well. I remember, I, don't, I haven't seen this since. But I remember uh, a review of the game in, a, in a, one of the papers the next day. And it said, well, Tottenham's title challenge, um, which in the end fizzled out. It's, it's the year that the club nearly, went under, nearly, went, out finan- <laughs> nearly went under financially. Um, yes. the, 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 the fellow running it, it's a bit like um, DiCaprio in Wolf of Wall Street. What's the future for Tottenham Hotspur? In a word diversification and he diversified into, into all kinds of things all of which lost money so uh, um, the, the club nearly went under and had to win the FA Cup more or less to, to, to kind of stay alive it's a very dramatic season but at this point you're still thinking Michael this this, this is a team with a, with a chance of winning, winning the title I remember this, this, this review in the paper the next day saying yeah we can take Tottenham's attacking brilliance for granted so whether Tottenham can win the title depends. And he went through the, def- the, the defence. It depends on a Norwegian, mm. an Isl- uh, 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 someone nice from thing. Iceland, yeah. uh, a, be- uh, 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 a Welsh Belgian, a diabetic, and Steve Sedgley. The diabetic, of course, was Gary Mabbott. Oh, that, that was a terrific way to to to, to end to end the article. And uh, that that defensive combination, anyway, they had real trouble dealing with Noel Quinn in the air. Didn't we come um, the last season? Spurs did quite well, didn't they? The yes. Yeah, I think um, it was third, something third, like that. So, you know, this, this, is the, is, yeah. this is the year that we're going to take it up a little notch mm. higher. This is the year. So th- there really was this buzz, mm. which carried on for a few weeks. Uh, and it, in the end, it all, it all, it all and, and Gascoigne kept on getting injured as well. And it all became this titanic struggle to, to win the FA Cup. But at this point, 
the dreams of all football fans at the start of the season are always going to be, you know, at the start of the season, we, we're going we're gonna to do something this year. But they were really, really strong. It was a lovely summer day towards the it end was, of a gorgeous summer. And what a the, moment to be alive, even without one's wallet. Not least if it was your birthday, because <laughs> on this day, the 25th of August, 1990, it was my 31st birthday. Oh, really? and I, I wasn't watching the match at oh, this look. point. I had been coerced back um, to supporting Charlton by some Charlton Athletic fans. I was really interested in what you said earlier, Daryl, about you know oh. the frustration of being a football fan when you felt not so much left out, but you felt like you, you were a problem. You know, um, and and it was as a black as I don't need to tell you because you know uh, your other uh, whammy was you know you're a child of Africa and um, you couldn't escape that. And there was a period which I don't think it's a football fan thing. From what I remember, because I'd been going to White Hart Lane since the age of eight, and I never really had any problem at White Hart Lane, but. When I used to go and see football away from from London, um, things started getting a little bit tasty, you know. Things started getting a little bit uncomfortable. And uh, there was a couple of times. Um, one time, uh, I'm pretty sure, and I could never ever remember, you know, which ground it is, but I'm pretty sure it was Birmingham, Birmingham City for whatever reason. Um, they had to make a hasty retreat to the train station afterwards and so on. And just like you, I got to the point where you just thought, ah, fuck this for a laugh. Mm. And I had a really bad incident, um, a, a near tragic incident in Germany. And I was disillusioned. And it was a set of Charlton fans who were I think the first club, I, I could have this wrong, but it's about the beginning of the nine, about 1990, set up a Charlton Fans Against Racism oh, organization. Yes. 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 And they came up to me and they were like, look, you've got to come back. You've got to come back. You've got to come back. Um, so at this point, I was sort of hovering around the area of uh, returning to football. Like I said, I don't believe it was, I mean, you might have a different experience, Daryl, but I can't remember anybody, and I'm not saying it's acceptable, but I can't remember anybody attacking, I sometimes went to football with a mate of mine who um, <laughs> came out to me at the age of 17. I don't think it was obvious to people that he may have been gay, but I've spoken to him and he says he doesn't actually remember hostility towards him, but obviously, you know, if people don't know, they're not hostile towards you, but... I, I remember a lot of the banter being about, you know, uh, famously that, that, and which he regrets till today. It has to be said, but, you know, the old, uh, what's his name of Liverpool, um, Rob uh, Fowler, Robbie Fowler of Liverpool. Oh, uh, great. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, what can you say about that? I think he truly does regret it. Um I think so, but uh, it's for every individual to judge about uh, the level of homophobia which he expressed yes. on, yes. on on the on the field on that day. But that's how I remember it more that people used it on the pitch and off the pitch, homophobic um, remarks to um, undermine, if you like, the opponent. Not saying it's acceptable. But like I say, I don't think it was the fans. And I think uh, the FA at the time missed a trick, which was at the point where they should have been embracing fans from everywhere. Because, you know, any business, uh, can you imagine Cadbury's sort of like thinking, <laughs> well, we're not going to defend the gay uh, eaters of our chocolate. We're just going to let it just, just let the homophobia exist and hope they carry on buying the chocolate. I can't imagine it in any business. And mm -hmm. I don't think the FA saw football as a business in those days because they'd have come down hard. They would have come down and hard and said, look, I know Dawson was only paying 
two shillings to go to White Hart Lane. But um, going back to 1968, you know, we'd like those two shillings, please, because today they want every single penny that you've got. Yes. You know, and mm. it's a you know, different scenario. But going back to the this match, and obviously for the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast, we always try and look at an iconic match. I did wonder why you had chosen this match, but now you've explained it. It all makes sense. I think you do have to start at Italia 90, not least because the weather that you mentioned there, Tim, um, Italia 90 was just one of those amazing World Cups where the sun always seemed to be shining. And Gaza was an expression of that sunshine. He was. Uh, Gary Lineker, uh, the, the moment, the tears moment, the reason why I say it's Shakespeare, and you imagine you've got Gary Lineker as part of of it, you know, okay to Graham Taylor, look, you know, watch his eyes, watch his eyes, you know, watch him, you know, look after him or whatever it is, you know, this is going to be a moment. And we all thought at that moment, and this is totally Shakespearean, we all thought we're going to win this match. We all thought, oh my God, Gaza isn't going to be there at the moment he needs to be there. We all thought we were going to win this match, not least because of Gaza's tears. Mm. You know, it's it's almost kind of like Iago. There, there's, a, in... there's another thing here, which is patriotism. Because uh, I remember the night of this game, as Daryl writes his, in, in his book, he was at a trade union meeting. And I remember the first time that I saw you after this game, you were telling me that lots of the, that some of the diehard activists yes. in that meeting were cheering for Germany. They wanted Germany for, to win. And I remember you saying to me, how do these people ever, ever expect to be elected? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, uh, it, was, uh, it was strange because I, I thought, you know, when you're watching TV and the football and every time England loses, you blame yourself. I got into that sort of, and every time we won, I didn't watch it. So I had a, it was actually Tim, a Labour Party meeting, um, and I was branch secretary, and um, people were saying, oh, you should rearrange it and everything. And I said, no, no, I don't want to watch that game. I'll just, I'll just, um, just uh, keep to the meeting. And um, it was quorum, but afterwards we went to the uh, Labour the trade union club, you're absolutely right. And um, yeah, there's a funny, there's a funny sort of what you want England to win. And so yeah, I mean, I also got it because uh, we played Cameroon. Do you remember? Of yeah. course, everyone remembers that game for Gary Lineker's penalties, etc. And um, again, you know, I was probably in a minority of one on the left who was supporting England rather than Cameroon. Mm -hmm. But you know, c'est la vie. Uh, that's been uh, uh, uh but, but do you want to do you want to explain that a little bit though daryl because it's because the tories are in power at that point isn't it and uh an england victory would somehow shore up uh was it margaret thatcher or was it yeah, John no, Major i, I think then? it goes beyond that i think it's almost like doctrine of revolutionary defeatism <laughs> you know you, you, you think so <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. I know some of these people, and Daryl has spent his life yes. in the company of, of of these people, and and I think that that's honestly, it's not yeah, just because it was a Tory government. It, I think you're right, Tim. Let's not let them off the hook. Mm. Uh, we've had too much of that. I I, I think it, yeah, it wasn't just um, the fact that Tories would go on to win because you know you'd have a repeat of 1970 but reversed, i.e. 1970. You know, Harold Wilson uh, called a general election thinking that England would get through to the final of the World Cup. But they lost, and um, it's said that he lost the election because of that. And he won the 66 election because exactly. England won the World Cup. It so, is. yes, I, I, I don't know. I, we were, what, two or three years from the general election. Thatcher was still clinging to power, wasn't she? Uh, despite the poll tax, she didn't go till November of that year. Um, I think, though, in terms of my circles, you know, I was a qualities officer. It, uh, it was very difficult for me to justify, I was born in Africa, why I was supporting England ahead of Cameroon, mm. um, for example. Um, 
in the quarterfinals. To, to prove Norman Debit's uh, Norman Debit's <laughs> acid test wrong, obviously. Well, um, actually, 1990 uh, was the year that Norman Tebbit made that remark. I think. Mm-hmm. I think you'll find it was because yes. I did an article that was published in the local paper trying to say, um, you know, that it was no sort of test whether or not you supported England. You know, we're we're a do, nation. Do you know, do you, know, do you know what I think people don't um, get how deep that statement by Norman Tebbit was mm. in many ways. I think that the story hasn't really been told about that. I think that was a really, really important moment. And I hate to sort of say it was the it was a statement that, y- you know, um, almost ensured or it was a statement that forced all of us um people of overseas heritage here in britain to take a good hard look at ourselves and to think again you know like they say you know go back and think again mm-hmm. and a lot of people there were people on all sides of this debate but i'd never been asked the question before of why for example i would sometimes support Brazil. Um, I can't remember ever supporting Brazil against England, but, you know, sometimes the frustration... Well, I know know you're African rather than Caribbean, but what about the West Indies in cricket? Well, that's a different thing, though. That's a completely different thing because uh, West Indies represented um, Caribbean people in Britain. They did. I mean, I couldn't say Nigeria or Cameroon or which African football team represented... Um, African people living in Britain. In those days, they represented people in Africa, in their countries. It was a different thing. When the West Indies came over, it was suddenly, right, here we go. Okay, it's our turn now. Come on, let's go. And when you went to the grounds, it was clear that there was a community of Mm -hmm. uh, Caribbean people living in Britain who had come out to have a good time. You know, uh, we play ball as well, you know, and... um, I think that was different. In fact, I envied my West Indian friends that they had this sort of uh, tribal uh, moment together. And then when the West Indies left after a tour, they were back to, you know, the old grind that the rest of us uh, were having to deal with as well. But that moment is, I mean, just like you, I'm not saying that the journey of gay football fans goes hand in hand with the journey of uh, football fans uh, of, you know, different races. No, I'm I'm not saying that. But each of us faces a moment, don't we? Each of us face a moment, a, a moment of decision where we have to declare our hand and say, look, I'm a football fan first and foremost, yeah. and this is a football team that represent me, and I'm going to grab hold of that. I'm going to seize that moment mm-hmm. uh, because we're part of it. Remember, it's our mates as well. This is a frustrating thing. I'm sure you'll attest to, Daryl. Your mates are going out to – well, I'll give you an example. Outside football, when we used to go out to um, clubbing, as it used to be called in those days, there was a lot of racism at the clubs. Oh, yes. A lot of racism. They would not let black boys into the Lyceum mm. on mm. a soul night. On a soul night. And you talk about Tottenham. I don't know if you remember that club, Charlie Browns. It was oh, yes, Charlie Browns. Yeah, Charlie Browns on the one-way system in Tottenham. Mm. Mate, it was so blatant. They were all BMP at Charlie Browns. He's been pulled down now because one-way systems all changed. But it was like this hot club, which black guys particularly, um, had made successful. But the thing was, you know, in all of these things, you know, black guys going out with white girls, oh, that was just too much for, like, uh, the bouncers on there to take. So they just did this blatant thing. And SWP, Socialist Workers Party, and all these people used to be part of the demonstrations, they organised demonstrations. Mm -hmm. On Lordship Lane, just not more than 100 yards away from where I lived, was the main BNP office of that area. You know, Tottenham was a volatile area in terms of race relations. We didn't bring it. We we it wasn't us. I mean, like these are my mates, but they would go into Charlie Brown. So I'll see you later, Dawson. 
Can you imagine mm. that? Can you imagine mm. that? But it was a tough yeah. one to take, but they're your mates. Yeah, also, let's stop, you know, uh, gay clubs um, that had black, some black people at were run by white people who call those clubs jungle and stuff like that. I mean, the ra- the racism amongst uh, the, the gay community was rife in those terms. So there wasn't really a place uh, to feel safe. It was always on their terms um, that you slotted in. And I think that's really interesting about the cultural uh, thing, connection of sport. The Bob Marley film, I haven't seen it. Uh, there's part of me that wants to, but there's part of me thinking oh, I might be disappointed, you know what I mean? Because he's such an icon. And uh, how do you make a film about someone like that? But the connection between uh, 1975, the West Indies tour, uh, the beginning of Notting Hill Carnival really becoming a, a national event in the mid 70s. And um, yeah, I can see it. I can. I supported the West Indies in '75 as well for that tour. That was seminal. That was a a moment in history, and a bit. I think like 1990 as well. The Shakespeare tragedy. You know, there was a play, wasn't there? A, a night with Gary Lineker. I was going to bring that up. Mm-hmm. I actually think that that was an important moment as well. Yes. You know, that play. Yes. Um, maybe for the gay community, you know, you can tell me. But I certainly think it broke down a lot of prejudice in football. Oh, it was. We had a theatre trip. <laughs> exactly. You know, uh, West End. West End, yeah. It was on the Haymarket. I seem to remember that. And I, I, I went and saw it like everybody else. Mm. But the crowd in that theatre, you might remember, it was mostly women. <laughs> there yes. were four women yes. going to watch a play about a footballer than I'd ever seen. And if there was a moment that you'd say, you know, what broke down football for women supporters, I think that play has got to be up there with a shout of having said that. Suddenly, if for no other reason, you might think it's patronising, the idea that Gary Lineker's got nice legs, um, brought people to see football, yeah, why not? We needed that. We actually needed women coming to see football. Of course we did. Of course we did. Yes. Look at it Um, now, you know. Yeah, but so, when you look at it now, it just that seems like light years away. It seems I know, like I almost know. unimaginable. Yeah. So this match clearly was an important moment. I think yeah. the next important moment that this preempts um, more the Italian ninety, but you know, Tottenham was a a fashionable club at this point because of Gary Lineker, because of Gaza, and one or two other players as well. And I think it preempts the Euros of '96, which mm. I well, Terry Venables, you know, manager at the indeed, time. Indeed, that's we that's the link. We have a certain about us, as you say, as 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 Tim rightly says. You look at the team sheet, and then you look at the defence, and you think, yeah, <laughs> that, that was the problem. <laughs> you look at the midfield, right? Um, Paul Skewer. Um, Paul Gascoigne, um, uh, Paul Allen, mm. but then Naeem, he makes that lovely ball for Gary, uh, for Gary Lindsay. Gorgeous, brilliant, gorgeous. <laughs> yes, so he's lovely. brilliant. But the gorgeous. timing of that pass is, is, yes. is sensational. Is long, Naeem was one that Venables had got from, from Barcelona. Uh, yes, yes, of course. But you talked about actually racism on the terraces, and I think you're right. I didn't, I didn't, uh, think by the 90s that seemed to be having its you know um expressive racism but actually naive um did did get some because of his arab connections um and um, that's quite sort of interesting considering where we are are now but uh, there was a couple of times where i had to tell people that that's rubbish. Just shut up. You know he's playing for us and stuff. So that sort of um, uh, did happen. I remember, um, which aggrieved me that season. But yes, he turns out to be a Spurs legend, doesn't he? Um, but you look at that side and you think, um, 
it's got everything except a defence, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, um, so Tottenham win 3 1. And well, we, uh, we, and there is the moment, it's the moment everyone has gone for. It's the Gascoigne goal, of course, yeah. which that, is that, the third goal. You know, yeah, it's the yes. third, it's, it's the clincher because yes. City are City are every time they cross to Niall Quinn, they, they frighten us to death. Yes, so, you know, every, that, that, time. every time. So, mm. they're, a bit naive, though. they're a bit naive with that Gascoigne goal because he's yeah, sitting yeah, waiting they're, they're, for it I thought yeah, they're, they're not defending very well are they no, no. but the, the, no. but it's it's the moment that the whole crowd has come for and so it, it's the, I think I, I suspect even quite a lot of the City fans would have gone I'm happy having seen him what was gliding it like? yeah what was it like in the stadium to see uh, one of the heroes certainly of Italian 90 if not the um, you know everybody's darling from 1990 um, well, I've, I've always thought football should be played in the sun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, not too sport... hot, though. <laughs> <laughs> not, not... That's, a, that's a real English answer, isn't it? Not too well, hot. Exactly. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. And, I, I, yeah, the, what I remember about it, you know, it was a week after my birthday, actually, Tom. So, you know, we're both Leos, I take it. Um, and I was 24, so Virgo. I you know, it Virgo. was Virgo, yeah, I'm on the cusp, Virgo. I'm afraid, oh, Virgo, you're on yeah. the cusp, okay. Um, <laughs> but it, you know, shirts off and stuff like that, I still had a body that people might want to see. Mm. Um, so it was that, that was the atmosphere. And uh, imagine if we'd actually won Italian, what it oh, would have that would been. have been amazing. Uh, but uh, and I mean, as Tim says, it was. A momentous year in Tottenham's history because um, of what happened to the club. We nearly went out of existence, didn't we? Um, Eleven million pounds, I think, was uh, the deficit we had. Eleven million, which doesn't sound it a sounds lot nothing. Yeah, <laughs> but that's what should have bought the club for, you know. And um, and of course, it was Gas's season. Those sorts of goals where he runs with the ball, gets it. And shoots shoots it across the goal were just synonymous of um, the cup run. I think he scored in almost every game of our cup run, including and then, course, that wonderful goal in in the semi final against yeah. who? <laughs> against you, start, who? you started seeing neutrals go to White Hart Lane yeah. just to watch yeah, Gaza. Just you to know? Watch it, yeah. it was. Definitely. Have, you, have you ever seen footage of Babe Ruth? Yes. There's a similarity there. <laughs> Because the, the upper body is, yeah, well, the upper body is, is quite big. And the, the, the legs just look like little matchsticks. And, and you know, the way that he, he, the way that, that this figure could have such balance. Yes. It, it, it was, I, I well remember the moment that, because when we first bought him, I spent a little while thinking, what have we got here? Was this a show <laughs> pony? Is, you know, what, what is the? And then there was a game, it was a home against, against Millwall. Millwall. Dark satanic mill wall. Indeed. Uh where Daryl used to work. And mm. um he he went on one of those runs and he hit the shot towards the top corner. And the keeper dived and made a terrific save. He, he, he tipped it over the bar. And Gaza stood there and he celebrated. Mm. He was just so in love with what he'd just done. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Even though it hadn't been a goal. You know, he just mm. brilliant. He, he was the joy of what he, he did the little run and then the shot. And he was so happy with it, you know. Mm-hmm. And that's the moment that that he captivated me. That, that, that there was that that childlike sense of of joy. The I Norman by, wisdom. The Norman yes, wisdom. Yes, I yeah. think this by this time maybe we all feared that there wasn't going to be a happy ending. But let's in, let's enjoy it while it lasts because it was. Mm-hmm. And as Daryl said, I think we were watching maybe the best player in the world for for that one year. Yeah. Yeah. He was he was extraordinary. Uh, well, I think I'd concur with that. Uh, I really do. He was mm. extraordinary in that season. Um, but, took us single handedly to the to the FA Cup final, and I mean that single handedly. Yeah. And then, of course, single handedly, he <laughs> lost us the game. There you go. That wild tackle, and uh, more importantly, the money. The Lazio for his transfer, which we desperately needed, you know, to stay alive. Yeah. And people forget, you know, like I, I was saying earlier about standing on the shoulders of giants, people forget that England footballers weren't fancied in Europe. You know, for Gaza, no. he was probably yes. one yes. of two or three players 
in that season um, so, who had been transferred and to a top, top, top uh, Serie A side. Lazio would do the business in those days, you know, and mm -hmm. um, even at Lazio, the fans there probably appreciated him as much as we did. He had a good time out in Lazio, yeah, uh, famously with that face mask when he had broken his jaw or when, whatever it was, you know, even there he was... He was front page news here all the time whilst he was at Lazio. That's how big this guy was. And, you know, I cried, which I do often, as Tim knows, when I saw Gaza at a uh, book awards. He'd won a book award for his uh, biography and he'd lost so much weight. But why I cried was in accepting that award and the few words he said, I think there was, and this is the ultimate Shakespearean um, denouement, there was a regret. There was a regret. He, he knew, he knew, he knows, and probably lives with that regret till today that he was destined for much, much more. Um, we are what we are, aren't we? It's it, it's it's that's hard... Shakespeare. That is yeah. exactly Shakespeare. That's the end of Macbeth. And you know, this, Ma yes, yes, Macbeth true. realizes, oh my God, you know, if I'd only I... just, you know, behaved myself, I would have still been king, you know, and whatever and everything. But we are what we are, and that's and and this this quest to be what we are. Switching to the music, there's one that just leaps out of me here. I know what it which, is. Which I relate to you, Daryl. Go on. And that, that's George Michael. Yes, that's the only one that's that yeah, be, be, Because, and why why this leaps out to me is that George, like you, is from immigrant family and the immigrant story, and it, it, it's, it's really striking, I think, with both you and Don, the sacrifices that your father's made for the option that they took. And that's true with, with George Michael's dad in a certain way. You know, he was he was very, very focused on the work. He wants to send his kid to a private school and so on. It's, it's kind of the immigrant dream. And George Michael has to, in public, Deny. work out who he is and work out well, how I to find a way to live with it. I think he no, knew well, who well, he was. Well, well, I'm not sure that he does. I think mm. it, it spends mm. him a long time. And for me... The masterpiece is we're still six years away from it. It's older in 1996 when he's had the first, I think the first truly fulfilling sexual relationship of his life. And it inspires him. I think it's, that's an extraordinary album. And Spinning the Wheel is just an unbelievable song about the well, gay experience of that, of that time and, and fast and love. And, and But so yeah. here he's trying to find it. I, I think it, it's still forced. Brian, I, I don't particularly like it. But I think it, it's a human being trying to work his way through all of these situations in life. And that reminded me very much of you, Daryl. Oh, well, I wish I had his voice. <laughs> <laughs> and he's getting to the back of the queue, mate. <laughs> no, Not to talk of his songwriting. To say. But you know, a twist of fate here. George Michael lived in the next door street. George, my, I lived in uh, East Finchley. George Michael also lived in East Finchley in the next door street. Um, they they had a business, his family, and uh, he lived above the shop, so to speak. I'm not too sure whether it was a laundrette or a cafe, but they're going to put up a blue pack sign, I think, uh, for, for that. But it's literally just around from where I live, literally. Um, Amazing, isn't it? Coincidence, but um, yes, that's the only one I could really grab my hand on in that in that list. It wasn't as good as the one we had in the previous show for me. Well, and I, I I would say that there are a couple of moments. Should I just quickly tell yeah, you another yes. twist of fate? I'm probably not more than a mile away from East Finchley Station, um, oh. as where I live, as I'm speaking to you here every night. Every morning, rather, when I come, I finish my work at five o'clock in the morning and drive home. Every single morning, I pass by George Michael's home in Highgate, which is still empty. 
um, after his death, there was a shrine outside because not only did he own, you know, this amazing home in Highgate, but he also owned a sort of what looks like a a public um, space of uh, grass, you know, um, in front of it. So people had built um, a makeshift shrine and flags, uh, Cypriot flags or Greek flags and um, flowers for, for about a couple of years or three years maybe before they decided um, to bring that down. Why I say to him, he knew who he was. The Cypriot community was part of George Michael's landscape. It was my best friend, Hajj, who told me about Wham, because I'd been living overseas. And at that point, uh, the Cypriot community definitely knew that he was gay, or at least, you know, the youngsters knew that he was gay. His mother was still alive at that point. And um, from what I've read and from what I've heard, it was the mother more so than the father, as I remember, that it's not that she was homophobic, but she didn't know, and he didn't know how to tell her mm. that. That, that. That's what I've heard. Anyway, um, going back to the charts, George Michael does stand out, but actually the one that is surprising for me for all the wrong reasons is a version of... Janet Kay's Silly Games. Janet it's Kay. It's a dreadful, it is, dreadful it is. travesty of a version it is, of a great exactly. song. No, totally, totally. I it takes all the space of Lovers Rock Away <laughs> and puts this fucking <laughs> stupid beat in there. <laughs> Everyone involved <laughs> should be ashamed of themselves. <laughs> well, even Janet, I'll tell her that you said yeah, that yeah. Um, because she's a very good friend of my missus and I virtually see Janet Kay perform if not every weekend, every other weekend. Can she still hit those notes? Of course she can, yeah. Wow. And not only can she, the audience can as well. The audience can. I mean, it's an amazing thing to see. Both Janet and my missus, they don't have to sing a note of their songs because their audience sings yeah. along with them. But crucially, Janet, I remember one night uh, she had had, um, you know, she had a th uh, sore throat. She could barely speak. And she said, look, you lot are going to have to help me out tonight. And everybody's like, yeah, yeah. We didn't come here for you lot to sing. <laughs> this is karaoke for us. <laughs> and the moment, you know, when she hits the high note is the moment. And to be fair to Lindy Layton, Lindy Layton of Dub Be Good To Me um, beats international fame. She's a lover's rock singer. You can hear it. She's mm. a lover's rock singer. No, it's not her she, fault, is it? It's, it's just this horrible production. Thing. Well, it is her fault because she's there with Janet Kay, and Janet Kay is the backing singer. Yeah, yes. What they should have done yeah, for that note, I, I was watching it because I couldn't remember it. You know, I can't, I would never have bought it in those days. You have the Janet Kay version, you're going to stay well away from this one. But so I watched it on YouTube, and they're on top of the pop. She's got Janet Kay there, which I thought was a good thing. Let me bring the original singer on and give her some props. And I thought, no, when she gets to the note, at least they're going to sing it together, that note. Yes. But Lindy, Lindy Layton goes off on that. She tries her best. You're laughing your head off, <laughs> Daryl. She tries her best. But I'm sure they, did. they're using Janet Kay as the yeah. backing singer. And I'm mm. like, what a waste of a choice. Mm. But I thought... I thought that was the one that stood out for me uh, for all the Apart wrong reasons. From, you, you can you can see it, the, the rave era has now got, it's gone gone fully mainstream. And Groove is in the heart, mate. D yeah, I, I remember I remember telling you that I saw them at Brixton Academy. Yes, around yes. this time, Ooh. and Ooh. you could tell they weren't going to last. They did. They had nothing else. Well, nothing. No, yeah. Well, and none the, the, of them the, did. They're all one the, hit wonders. Yeah. But you mm. thought with them, you thought they had a song. You thought they, they had a mm. crowd there that. Wanted, want, wanted to go for it, wanted to dance, and they really didn't deliver. And then after the thing, after the show, it was, it was a rave. And I remember thinking, this is torture. This reminds me of a spell I, I did working in a wire factory in Watford. These fucking noises. And it was the first... I, I had quite a few mates who went off into this this rave thing. And for them, it was like it, it was a religious... Mm -hmm. commitment it, it really is. was you it know is. they yeah. thought they'd found another world but i can only say to them you found a chemical world <laughs> because if you take the drugs away sure. there ain't nothing left you know and 
I would say there is, but unfortunately, I think you're hundred percent right that the chemical um, contribution was overshadowed whatever else there was you see with delight and apologies daryl you feel free to come in here with delight okay. i'll tell he you could, what he could drop an e and become daryl tells <laughs> hold on hold on that um, would be too easy. <laughs> with delight multiracial group the first time i've seen a japanese a russian and an american woman mm -hmm. um tear up the dance floor and it's a decent tune but with all of these rave people they are at best one hit wonders at best they would have been better off rather than doing a concert and having a rave just being part of that rave and you know coming up and doing a pa of groove is in the right. heart yeah, and yeah, to yeah. get the rave going do you know what i mean yeah. just to be yeah. the cheerleaders of the rave that's always leave them wanting people. more yeah yeah that's where all these rave people but i think they had pretensions to be more yeah uh, probably their record company had pretensions yeah. for them to be more because it was such a huge hit. It was an international hit all over. The, they probably yeah. retired on that and still living quite well off it. And mm -hmm. it still sounds better than 90% or more. more come later. Yeah. 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 It's, it, it stands out for me. There's a couple of other things that just let me say this very quickly because you've got. Get it the off Joker. your chest, man. Get it off your chest. The Joker by the Steve Miller Band is an amazing track, and it's still out there now. Poison by Belle Biv DeVoe didn't last, but it was huge at the time. I was living in L.A. Um, just before this. So I was living in L.A. probably up to about uh, July, yeah, probably up to a month before this chart mm. of August 25th. And Belle Biv DeVoe just tore up the whole place. You know, the three of the members from uh, New Edition, uh, Bobby Brown and Ralph Tresvant uh, excluded and um, Johnny Gill excluded. So it would be Michael Bivens. It was the background kids of New Edition. They got together and thought, well, we can do this as well. And they came out with a wicked tune called... Uh, uh, poison not the lyrics ain't amazing you know that girl is poison i think we can live without that nowadays but that's a wicked track there and then there are two or three um sort of faux reggae songs there which sadly show the demise of reggae one of them by uh ub40 who uh, do a version by this point they're, they're doing all their um what they call it labor of love uh, it's tunes. karaoke, isn't they? Really, a, it a is. great band it become is. a karaoke band. Yeah, well, and also turned reggae into karaoke. I think uh, mm -hmm. that, that that's their greatest sin. And uh, there's a tune featuring Junior Reed, who was one of the great singers of uh, reggae, took over from Michael Rose as lead singer of Black Uhuru. And by now, what you're getting is pop bands thinking, OK, let's do a little bit of reggae, work for Beats International, let's do a little mm. bit of reggae, get a Jamaican guy from... That's that's the Soap Dragons, isn't it? I'm Free, Dragons, which again yeah. is, is, is the kind of, it's the kind of rave thing. Mm, mm. I, there's one of my all-time favourites here that I couldn't believe wasn't number one for six months. The Jungle Brothers doing our own thing. Tribe Called you know Quest is better. Yeah, Tribe, Tribe Called no, Quest, no, Bully no, Tackle Nothing Ball. could yeah, be better than yes, doing our own yes, game. Yes, sorry. I'm what, bad, what, what, Tribes what, like, what, like us always open doors, but what for? So you can get yours. You ain't into it. All you, all you want is profit. So I say, please don't. Please do stop it. Leave me alone. Get off my bone because I'm doing my own. He's good. It's the world Ooh. football phoning. Daryl? We're doing our own thing. Yeah, what was number one? Oh dear! Um, oh, if no. you have to ask, it's well, a bit I mean, teeny teeny that sum up the... it's a bit teeny weeny. Yeah, polka dot bikini. Brian Highland initially, but here some somebody called Bomba Lurina. Oh right! That's yes, not even no. Timmy Mallet. Well, it's not even Christmas, is it? Well, no. <laughs> what about Tom's Diner featuring Susan Vega at number two works. though? DNA. Yeah, that works, works doesn't it? it? Works, yeah. So there's one or two things in there that I would recommend. Um, and of course, you can't touch this by MC Hammer. He was the first yes. interview I did uh, for a newspaper when I was living in LA. And they sent me up to Oakland, California to interview him. I didn't know who he was. No. The editor said to me, he's a good dancer. He's a good dancer. So I go up there and I hear the tune, and the tune is basically a riff off of uh, Rick James's. Uh, what's the tune called? Uh, it's a really mm -hmm. naughty one. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, kind yeah. of girl your mother yeah. wouldn't like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, 
it was the biggest thing ever. He, from the moment I interviewed him to in the next year, he was worth from, you know, zilch to a hundred million dollars and he lost it. He lost it. It's Did a he? lesson to everybody. Yeah, he oh, lost it. Wow. Um, mostly on the GGs, horse racing or horses. His brother seemed to be, who was his manager or something, seemed to spend a lot of the money buying horses that never <clears throat> became much. But he lost it. Yeah, he lost it. It's a real as, lesson. Uh, as the lovely summer night of August the 25th became the morning of August the 26th, what was the soundtrack uh, there at Hampstead Heath, Daryl? <laughs> <laughs> what are you thinking about? What, what Jack Straw's Castle is what he's thinking about. <laughs> Jack Straw's Castle, yes. <laughs> uh, well, let's just say it was a birthday celebration, you know. It was one or two um, moments. But uh, look what I've got here, which you can't see if you're listening, um, which was um, the away fixture mm. um i i uh, it was in december because we were so successful we decided to go to the man city tottenham game um barclays lead division one do you remember that mm -hmm. and uh, their program was a bit cheaper one pound i can't remember the result actually but i what mm. i can remember is having a again a really great gay weekend because of course manchester had a Brilliant scene at that time. It still does. And it still does, yeah, I know, it still does. Mm. But uh, the one thing, <laughs> we tried to get into one of the gay clubs in, in Manchester on Canal Street, and they wouldn't let us in because we were all in football shirts. Well, you see. So... <laughs> So discrimination against football fans. Yes. All their years of discrimination. <laughs> there is there is serendipity about that, there I'm is. sure. Well, uh, isn't that an irony after yeah. all that? You know, like um, I said, this conversation today has been Shakespearean. And I know O Will as good as anybody. And he would have said in his in his uh, brummy accent or you know, um, Worcestershire or Warwickshire accent, whatever it was. Yeah. Um, well, this is what I was writing about, and you lot never <laughs> understood me. Well, I'm sorry, that is terrible, isn't it? It's is terrible. But anyway, it's been an absolute pleasure on that note. Uh, reacquainting with you, Daryl. Thank you thank very you. much. And you too, as well. And thank you and so much. Another chance to uh, to plug the book. Well, we're queer yeah, and we should queer. be here. We should be here. My memoir of supporting Spurs from 1978, uh, well, really 1989 till 2014 when we went official. I think it's fair to say you've told us about the perils of being a gay football fan. We haven't yeah. heard enough about the pleasures, but like Tim He's said, Tottenham Hampstead fan. Heath. They're, they're limited. <laughs> <laughs> there Even is a better. that we could talk about, which is that. Uh, quarter final between Tottenham and Liverpool when Klinsmann, but you know, let's do that on the next one. Yes, let's do that on the next one because there was a certain pleasure on the way up to the game. <laughs> and, uh, and 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 Rylan Clark, are you listening? Yes, yeah, you're standing you on the you're standing on the shoulder of a giant. Um, and I'm <laughs> sure you. he'd appreciate it as well. Rylan, uh, check the book out. Tim, thank you very much.